Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's uh, weekly webinar show where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. We do record the show as we are doing um, right now, today, and so you can uh, watch the show um, at your, later at your convenience. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to for anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the um, shows that we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. So that'd be similar to your state library. And we provide services and programs and things to all types of libraries in Nebraska. So you will find shows on Encompass Live uh, for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Uh, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. We have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do shows sometimes talking about things, services and programs we're offering here through the commission. Um, but we bring in guest speakers as well, and that's what we have today. Uh, my screen over here. Today we have joining us from, as you can see on the slide, see the slide here, from the Omaha Public Library, uh, the, the, the team who does their uh, book drop. Book Truck Pop Podcast. And so I'm just going to hand it over to all of to you all to um, introduce yourself and um, share what you've been doing with your um, new podcast. And who's up first? Can you still hang on? I lost the screen. Um, yeah, we're seeing the full the first slide of your of your presentation. Yes. Okay. I don't see it though. Hang on. Oh. Sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, you can try there and we share go. It. Okay. Now I see it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are the Book Drop Podcast team from Omaha Public Library. Today, we're going to talk about building a reading community through podcasting. I'm Erin Dewar. I'm the Readers and Writers Librarian for OPL, and I work at our Benson branch. I'm Michelle Carlson. I'm the book club librarian for OPL and I work at the W. Clark Swanson branch. Hello, my name is David Dick. I'm an adult uh, services specialist and you can find me at the Abrahams branch. Hey, I'm Anna Wilcoxon. I work at the South Omaha Library as the diversity and inclusion librarian for OPL. And we have a fifth member of this team. Uh, she recently got promoted, so she's not here today, but Ellie Roberts is OPL's new outreach librarian and She's an important part of our team, but since she's not here, we're giving her this entire slide to herself. <laughs> um, so what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to go over a little bit just background about the podcast, uh, how to make a podcast in 10 days, lessons learned, um, podcasting as an RA tool, future plans that we have and how to take this further and where you can find us on the interweb, internet. Um, some quick facts about us. Uh, we describe ourselves as a weekly podcast from Omaha Public Library that explores topics related to our community, libraries, and the joy of reading. Uh, Listen In as a team of OPL staff offers up reading suggestions, chats with guests, and occasionally geeks out about books, information, and pop culture. So we are in our third season. Uh, we are very close to hitting 16,000 downloads in that time. On Friday, we'll uh, publish our 95th full-length episode. Um, and in those episodes, we have mentioned somewhere around 2,679 titles or resources. And of those, around 780 or more have been more like full-length book talks. So, uh, ooh, sorry. Um, there's a lot of info out on the internet about how to make a podcast, all the research and stuff you need to do. So we're not going to go super in-depth to those kind of questions, um, but we do want to cover them briefly so you understand what this project kind of looks like. And how to make a podcast in 10 days might sound like hyperbole, but that is really what we did. Um, would we recommend it? 
honestly, maybe kind of, yes. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about the pros and kind, cons of that kind of timeline um, and what that looks like. So the our podcast is a product of the early days of the pandemic. I'm sure like many of you, uh, we closed our doors on March 15th of 2020. Uh, due to safety concerns of COVID-19. And a lot of us spent that first week at home, not working. And then we were asked to report remotely on March 23rd, the next week. And that first week of our pandemic work was um, spent setting up remote working expectations and making sure everybody had laptops and computers, whatever we needed to do to work from home. Mm -hmm. So at the end of that first week, uh, we were tasked with staff kind of at large were tasked with coming up with ideas for projects that would help us connect to our patrons who are now at home that we, won't, we weren't we were gonna see for a while. Um, what could we do that would add value to their um, experiences happening right now? So uh, I think I we sent out an email like on a Friday, what are your ideas? We came back the next week. Podcast was I think at the top of that list of a couple other things. We got a, basically like, a, we wrote up a small proposal. We got almost like a immediate yes, go ahead. The next day we started purchasing equipment. Um, I think early the next week we had already figured out our hosting site purchase. We'd set a name, we'd gotten music for our theme music, we'd cut it. And then on April 9th, we recorded our first episode. Um, so a lot of this is uh, figuring out like what we could have, what we already had that we could use, what kind of skills did we already have. Um, and things like we were already using Zoom, so that's easy, right? Or David uh, is a band, so he gave us music for free. So things like that are very helpful. Um, so what that research kind of looked like during that time period was um, figuring out things like our equipment, what technology will you need? So laptops, microphones, headphones, um, recording, what are your options? Can you use something you already own? We were already on Zoom, so that was easy. Is there a free option? Is there something else out there? Uh, we have now switched to Riverside, which is more um, podcast specific, and there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, who's gonna do editing, which is I think a big part of it. Is there something that's free that you can use or paid? Do you need something easy or do you have some skills in this area that you can utilize here? And who's gonna do it? It'll probably be a big chunk of your, your time for this project. And then you'll need a hosting site. So explore your options. Uh, what's your budget? How many hours do you need a month? Uh, what analytics do you need? We started on Buzzsprout and uh, we are still on Buzzsprout and I feel pretty good about some of the analytics that we get on that backside. So the other part of that research is just figuring out who you are as a podcast. So what's your niche essentially? Um, so we went out, uh, thought about a lot of the podcasts that we were already listening to, but also did research into what kind of library podcasts were out there. Um, and we found a lot of library podcasts that were focused for library specific or for other librarians. Um, so when we were thinking about our audience, we very clearly wanted to make sure that we were focusing on patrons first or just the reading community at large. They don't have to be OPL patrons at all. Um, but that was our main focus. Um, so the questions we're asking ourselves is, what is the vibe, which is a word that I feel like we use a lot. Um, we always, we probably started out a little more formal just because we didn't really know what we were doing or who we were yet. Um, but we always wanted this show to be pretty casual. So hopefully it feels like you're hanging out with friends talking about books. And then what is the format? Um, if you listen to a lot of podcasts, it feels like there's some pretty basic formats that are used. We use like a loose three act structure. Uh, we open with intros, what's coming up at the library, an icebreaker. Um, sometimes we use that time to interview another staff member or an outside guest. Um, and then the bulk of our episodes are usually discussions either around a specific topic or kind of a roundup of book talks based around a theme or a genre. And then we close every episode with a query of the week, which is just a question that we ask each other. We try to put it out on the internet and get listener um, answers as well. That just kind of sometimes goes along with the theme um, or it could just be something completely random. And so the final part in all of that kind of research phase was making sure we're getting approval. Um, this will look entirely different for every organization since we have multiple departments and organization it was very likely that you 
we'll forget that someone needs to be involved in this process. So for us, this is what that looked like. Um, our adult services manager uh, was in charge of making sure we're getting those purchasing uh, things done, helping us decide what team members are on this team, the time of time commitment everybody can put forward to it, and just a general idea of what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we have a marketing department, so they were there to help us create a logo, uh, approve our name. They're in charge of all of our promotion on social media and on the website. And then also they're in charge of anything that goes out under the OPL head, basically. So anything that gets on the internet, they have to go through, has to get their approval. And then admin is there just for kind of the big high level stuff, our name, uh, content, and just kind of the commitment that we're making to this organization overall. So if 10-ish days sound like an escalated timeline, you are right. Uh, this is not our normal pace of creation, um, but this was the gift that the pandemic gave us. It, it took, in those early days, it took away all of our barriers that usually slow down this kind of productivity or creation. Um, so our timeline from approval or from idea to approval was very teeny tiny. Um, and now Michelle is going to talk about what we learned during our early days and going forward. So as Elle Woods famously said, what, like it's hard, like <laughs> doing all this and making a podcast and a during a pandemic when you're not even in your library branch and all that kind of stuff. Um, so in the past nearly three years that we've been working on this, we have learned quite a bit. And so I'm going to talk you through some of those things that we have learned. Um, so first was about the sustainability of this project. How do we keep doing this week to week without just flat out exhausting ourselves? Um, and so part of that was that we talked to each other um, every single day, or excuse me, after every single episode, we have what we sometimes call our mini therapy sessions where we check in with each other, not just about like the podcast itself, but you know, within the world and how we are doing. So building that team is part of how we were able to kind of keep this going also. Uh, we also track our stats the way that Aaron was, you know, we have Buzzsprout to give us that like hard data, um, but we also keep what we call a titers, titles featured master list. So that's how, and we have a little checkbox if we actually book talked it or if we just mentioned it. And then we have the resource list that comes out with every single episode also, that's um, part of our Biblio Commons, um, online catalog uh, so that people can kind of go back and look at those things and we then those are all linked and we can get stats on those clicks and all that kind of thing too um and in the beginning Aaron was doing all of these things so one way that we also figured out how to make it work was by splitting up those tasks and so Anna makes our resource list now um, I help enter our stats and stuff and so we're all just you know in it together in that way. Um, and then Aaron talked um, about technology and technology as we know, especially in the library world, is always evolving. Um, and so as she had mentioned, you know, we used to use Zoom, but then we're able to switch to Riverside when we realized um, the quality of our broadcast and all that, um, that we had the capacity, budget and all that to increase it in that way. Some of our equipment has needed upgrades as well over the time. Some of us needed new cords and all that. Um, new ring lights and <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, keeping uh, in, in touch with the budget and our admin on those types of things, which then leads me also to support. As Aaron had also had all those check marks of where we got approval from, we need that approval, unfortunately, maybe, <laughs> as we keep going, um, you know, uh, because things change every year to year. And so um, we're, blessed with that continued support from our admin and our branch managers um, because this does require, you know, not being on desk um, to record and some of that other planning and that kind of thing. So you need that continued support to keep it going. Um, and then we are librarians and we're talking about books, but we all know that we don't get paid to read books. Um, and so balancing that professional awe and not getting burnt out on reading while having to talk about what we are reading or and and all those books and all those different resources and stuff and so that's a constant lesson i don't know if any of us have a way that we've really nailed that yet but we're aware of it and that's step one right 
All right. The other big lesson was just planning in general. So when we first started, we were going literally week to week. Sorry, my room has a light sensor and it's all the way over there. Um, so we were going week to week with a brand new episode and it was a little exhausting. Um, and so we decided for season two specifically that we would do uh, record three episodes or three weeks and then take a week off. Um, so instead of like at the end of our recording where we were trying to plan the whole rest of the season, we have um, once a month a planning meeting for a full hour that we have to talk to each other about um, the big ideas, plan like the next quarter of themes, um, talk about who, what guests we might want or just all those types of ideas. And that I think has really helped us um, keep our vision, the vibe of the podcast um, fresh and again, sustainable. Um, we have uh, then our episode outlines. So part of our planning is that we have in a Google Doc, a live Google Doc that we can all, you know, be editing uh, whenever we need to, uh, one for each episode that has where we can list our titles because sometimes we read the same books and so we want to make sure we're not going to talk about the same books. Um, or like just also kind of make sure that we're not talking about the same kind of books and that kind of thing within the genres or or whatever that week's topic was. Um, and so in that we might write out our full book talk, we might just take bullet points, um, we'll note the other like links of articles that we're going to be talking about to share with each other. Um, and we also with OPL we have uh, Slack, so we have our own private Slack channel for the five of us to be able to communicate about all of this and are kind of then whenever we're working kind of in touch with each, touch with each other and planning. Um, the last big lesson was the tone, that vibe as we like to talk about. Um, and so part of that was with building our team. Some of us hadn't actually worked together before. Um, so we were all, all part of the team called the Well-Read Collective. Um, and so within that we've you know, worked a little bit together on genre studies and that kind of thing, some outreach events, but we otherwise, spending a week together and talking about books directly is very different. <laughs> Um, and so it was uh, getting to know each other, our personalities, our pacing, um, and that kind of thing, which also can be hard online. So that was just kind of a lesson as we kept going through. Uh, with book talking, David's going to talk more about um, the book talking, but one of the lessons was just our own comfort level with where we're at with that skill um, and finding our way, the one that fits and works for us, you know working through our pacing, our vocal tics, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then personally, I know one struggle I have is talking about a book before I've actually finished it or read it by the time that we're recording. And just always that, uh, like, do I do it? Do I find something else? And that kind of thing. And so getting comfortable with that, talking that through with the team. And so that comes to our group norms and our shared expectations that we have while we're recording. Um, so one of the things that we worked on so we aren't interrupting or talking over each other because you know even with the best internet nothing is like super simultaneous so we raise our hands <laughs> so we look at each other's little boxes and we see like oh after Erin's done with her book talk Michelle wants to say something so I'm gonna pause and stuff and so to give that space for the next person to talk and share their their thoughts um, and so, and then within that is our own self-awareness also of working through, you know, how we're not one dominating a conversation and making sure that we're sharing, you know, kind of the, the airtime and that space itself. Um, and then there's the personal versus professional. So podcasting feels like a very, um, I, I know I listen to like at least 15 podcasts a week myself. Um, and so you know, and one thing I love about them is the way that you're actually getting to know those people. And so it's our own balance that we are doing this though as a representative of Omaha Public Library and so in a professional capacity. And so trying to balance that as well as like, you know, wanting to build relationships with listeners and each other by sharing some details about our lives, but not everything. Um, and then also it's the, what is too much? And so if you if anybody has listened, 
sometimes we have said a swear word. Um, and so balancing that, you know, we don't have the, is it the FCC, the, you know, the, the one that could find you if you like swear on live television or whatever. And so, but our marketing department has kind of given us the scope and um, expectations of, of that kind of thing for not being, we're not an explicit podcast, but you know, some titles, you know, some of them have swear words in them now. And so how can you talk about that without saying it and that kind of thing? So um, there's a balance there. Um, and so those are kind of the big lessons that we learned along the way. And so, yeah, we'll go into now, we're gonna do our little mid presentation, query the presentation. This one is for the panelists. And so, um, cause I think you'd love to hear them from them individually about the lessons that they've learned. So friends, what do you know now that you didn't know before? Erin. Uh, my biggest lesson I think is that effort on the front end will pay off in the back end. I think mm. like getting Zoom was a great thing to start with, but like getting a software that was made for podcasting, you know, it saves me like 50% on editing time. And so make if you can make those little jumps of sometimes that's a financial investment, but sometimes it's just finding out a like more streamlined process is totally worth it. Awesome. David. I learned, uh, well, I knew before that I talked really fast, but I know what my voice sounds like sped up to double speed. So I learned to slow down some. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I am learning and still learning this, uh, but to be a little, like to worry a little less about perfection, I think like having to do things quickly and um, kind of like the quasi casual format of the podcast makes me feel a little bit better about not being so hard on myself if I like, I don't know, say something or for, I don't know, forget something, or maybe I didn't have a time to read something as deeply as I wanted to, just being uh, a little, more okay with not doing things like perfect 100% um, like A plus work, but A minus work is still what I would hope for. <laughs> no worries in that. Yeah. Um, and then for me, it was definitely going back to that professional awe of getting back to the joy of reading and not feeling like it's just my job to read. Uh, we do have our book club episodes, which are super fun so that we are talking about a shared book, but that's still in some ways a book assignment. And so I think I've done a better job of finding books that fit within our theme that I already want to read. And so then it's not, you know, laborious of like, oh yeah, I have to read that book for the podcast this week so I can talk about it adequately. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do actually, one more thing, I guess, I don't know if it's yeah. maybe a lesson, but I do think that um, like being a part of this team and talking about books so regularly has really broadened my personal reading scope, which has been a really like yeah. lovely side effect of this. Like I definitely still have like my own vibe, I guess, for the kind of books that I gravitate towards, but just knowing about a greater number of books in more detail has really made me interested in reading more broadly, which has really been a, a lovely side effect of, of this podcast. Awesome. Cool. And with that, we're gonna go to David. <clears throat> All right. So speaking of swearing, here is our first uh, our first beep of the podcast. So many books. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to talk <laughs> about podcasting as a reader's advisory tool, uh, and I'm going to go over reader's advisory immersion therapy, which is basically what this is. Uh, podcasting as a library commercial, and just some of the challenges of podcasting versus more traditional book talking and reader's advisory. All right. Immersion therapy getting to know you. Uh, this is a great way to learn how you book talk because you're doing it so much. You're really getting to learn your own quirks and your tics, but also your style and approach. Uh, I've started to be able to keep track of things that I know appeal to me a lot better than just saying, oh, I liked that. Uh, just by seeing everything in a spreadsheet after I'd talked about some very similar titles over the course of a month. And you'll also be greatly aware when you hit a slump and kind of 
learn how to talk about when you're in a slump, talk about something maybe you read a year ago just by looking over your Goodreads review or just even what you rated it as, as well as your quirks and habits as a reader. I uh, like having the pie graph and story graph, which I started because of this podcast, just seeing, like, I knew I liked horror, but seeing just like how much of that graph it took up was something I would have no idea about if it wasn't for this podcast. And we also will vary really wildly about how in-depth our work, our, um, our notes are. And for me, that could be how much I loved the book, but it can also just be like how up for improvisation I am that week. Uh, some weeks I can just go off the cuff and keep going. Other weeks it was busy at the desk and I really need those notes to go off of because I'm having a hard time talking about uh, about books just unprepared. So that is what you'll learn about yourself. And this really is a library commercial and it's not just for OPL. Yeah, we talk a lot about our own library here, but this, we have a uh, pretty, we have like one of the great thing about the analytics is we found out a lot about the size of our audience and we have some international listeners too. And we have a lot of listeners in the South, like around Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, some of them have even reached out to us. And so it's a really useful tool for raising visibility of the library uh, when people talk about, we're hoping we're doing a small part when people talk about the needs of, a, of the library in the current age that we can demonstrate everything a library can do and a way to do virtual programming on the regular rather than just as a couple times a year event. And it is a great way like in the balancing of the personal and the professional to show us both as reading experts, you know, people who really know what we're talking about and really knowing how we can delve into books and describe how things appeal to people and being able to sell books, uh, sell the idea of books to our audience if it's what they want to read, but also be able to describe exactly what the appeal is so that the people who might not like a particular book, for example, I just finished Tinder's The Flesh, loved it, five out of five stars, made me feel awful. Uh, so like how to talk about a book that might be controversial in that regard, or you know, that not everyone might, might like in a way that gets the people who love it, you know, that they can find it, but the people who might not love it will know by how you talk about it if it's not for them. And also just to show that librarians are cool people to hang around with and to dispel some of the the stereotypes that we just want people to be quiet and we're just sit around and read and do nothing else. Ah, uh, yeah, that's, we do, we share the mission of the library in that regard. Uh, we also can use it to promote our events and our services. Um, every episode that we've talked about earlier, we talk about what's coming up at our library. That's a brief part and, but it's, I think it's an important part. Because even for people who are outside our service area, it shows the kind of things that can be at a library and what we're capable of. Uh, right now, we are going to be promoting our Omaha Read since that just got announced. We saw that. And yes. so, awesome. Yeah. And so we'll be able to, we've had a special mini episode about uh, the Omaha Reads book. Well, no, we've had like a full length episode about it too before. And so just the being perfume. able to... Correct. Just, yeah, yes. just being able to show what we can do. And then sometimes we have behind the scenes episodes. So if people really want to get into the inside uh, baseball and see how libraries tick, we can talk about things like this is how we choose books to purchase. This is what our day to day looks like. Uh, this is, yeah, this is, uh, these are some tips for getting a hold of what you want to get a hold of and all of that. Uh, our annual reading challenge is a huge part of the content we uh, create. We do several episodes throughout the year around specific themes. We don't hit all 12, but we especially make sure we hit the 12 that might be harder to get. Like a lot of people don't know what micro histories are. I didn't know what micro histories are until we started doing, uh, well, until it got announced on the reading challenge, but there was like, oh yeah, I read a lot of those. But yeah, so we do a lot about the reading challenge. And we even do a special episode called the reading challenge help desk where we take uh, submitted questions and we have people say, hey, I'm having a hard time with a micro history. Here's a book I love, what should I read? Which that's a lot of fun because it gives us, it gives us the feeling of like our outreach events like at the uh, night market where we can kind of tailor our responses based off of an interaction. 
So even though it's not a live interaction, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And this work requires us uh, touching in with other departments a lot, like directly. Uh, guests, we have to reach out to guests and then we have to figure out uh, how they can get equipment to uh, record with us and how they can uh, work around their schedules because we have our time blocked off, but that's not necessarily gonna work for anyone we might want as a guest because you know, we record during the time that we're open. So people need to be able to take an hour plus off desk and then also meet with us in advance to kind of plan out the episode and make mm -hmm. sure that uh, we're all on the same page before going in. And uh, yeah, there's uh, behind the scenes work with other departments, which we've kind of already talked about, just like making sure we get things approved, working with uh, working with marketing and all that. Uh, we also like during the reading challenge help desk, a lot of people like to do reading challenges with their kids. And the reading challenge is kind of seen as an adult program. So one of the reading challenge entries is read a book mentioned on the podcast. And most of us talk about adult books. There's a few kids books here and there. But one thing we do during the reading challenge help desk is we have youth services write us out a few brief book talks that we read for them. And then that's a book mentioned on the book drop for uh, people to read with their kids. And sometimes we have to work with collection development quite a bit. Like uh, sometimes we want to really talk about a book that the library hasn't purchased. So we have to email them and say, hey, could you please, please, please buy this book? It really fits the theme of this episode and I really want to talk about it. And that's that's a lot of fun. Like our uh, preview episodes too, sometimes we have to touch base with collection development uh, and make sure that they're going to purchase a book that hasn't appeared in the catalog yet, uh, which can be a lot of fun and yeah so it's more than just the team it's it's the whole system mm -hmm. yeah. so before we go on though you're gonna have to explain uh what is a micro history oh a micro history <laughs> is a history about a very specific topic uh for example the uh one that i am going to talk about at our upcoming event the book bash and i have talked about on the podcast before is called sellout and it is the history of all the punk and uh, hardcore bands that signed to major labels between like 1994 and 2007. And yeah. so it like each chapter goes into a different band. So, you know, like if you want to hear about how Green Day sold to a major label and couldn't get gigs in the cool clubs anymore, you have a chapter on that. You have okay. a chapter on like Jimmy Eat World, Blink-182, just going through that. And so it's just a very like hyper-focused history of like a very particular topic yeah, there okay. are um micro histories of all kind uh one that i am saving for the uh podcast episode on them is called cannibalism a perfect uh, perfectly natural history so if you want to hear about that tune into the podcast <laughs> Uh, okay. This wasn't meant to segue quite that way, but we have a lot about food, I feel like in our collection as well. A lot of micro histories, so like books about like the history of butter or salt or milk, like the kind of like yeah. So. And you can argue cannibalism, a perfectly natural history, fits under a micro history <laughs> about food. Uh, food and book talk, book or book groups and book clubs seems to go together. My mother's book group that she's in. Uh, they actually sell. We are a reading and eating group. Sometimes eating comes takes priority depending on what we're. But yeah. <laughs> My personal book club is a reading and eating group. Like we <laughs> find something that is themed around uh, around the book. So, like sometimes it's Italian food, sometimes it's Indian. You know. But anyway, back on. Uh, now I'm going to talk. Like a lot of this ended up being some of the some of the challenges or some of the harder things you need to adjust to for a podcast versus uh, traditional readers advisory and not trying to be negative here but i do think these things are important to keep in mind if you want to do something like this so um try not to think of these as negatives just things that are different that you need to accommodate for uh one is that it's an audio only format like when we have to do a book talk for someone just like grabbing a book out of the stacks or if we're at an outreach event and we're up in front of people, or if we are at something like the night market, you're with the person. And so you get the face-to-face -face interaction. For the podcast, it's audio only. So there are components you need to be ready to work around for that. Like for instance, you can't show the cover. You kind of can if they look at the resources list, but I tend to listen to podcasts while doing other things like, uh, doing chores or 
working on some of my off desk things at work or uh, cooking or playing video games. So that visual component isn't there for me, even if there is an online resource list. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and then part of it is learning how to talk about illustrations. Uh, for me, this is a really big challenge because I'm a big graphic novels reader. And this is especially hard for graphic novels because the pictures aren't just in it, they are an important part of it. And there can be experiments with format. So for example, on the, at the Book Bash coming up, which is a virtual event where there'll be cameras, I'm talking about uh, Red Rosa, which is a graphic biography of Rosa Luxemburg, who was a, uh, a Jewish-Polish uh, socialist between the world wars. But it's uh, there are uh, parts where the layout is really experimental, like showing a time when she was in jail during World War One. And so I'm going to need to hold up the book and talk about the way the panels are laid out. Mm. When I talk about it on the podcast, I have to learn how to start using appeal terms and just work around that. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Another thing that is huge is it's a one-way interaction. Like even when you're doing a book talk for an for a live audience where you can see them, you're able to get you know like the visual affirmations. You can tell if people are checking out that kind of thing. Um, this yeah, we're having a conversation with each other and we can tell if what we're talking isn't clicking with our co-hosts, but we're also talking to like hundreds of people in other places and we can't pivot if something isn't working. You know, like at the desk, if someone says they like a certain genre and you start talking about what you liked in that genre and you see their eyes start to gla uh, glaze over, you can say, well, but we also have this. Not an option at all. So you just have to... Um, Deliver it like it's working, and that can be kind of hard sometimes. And uh, you also have to make peace with the ums. You can edit out some of them. You can't edit out all of them. And so, like, you have to, like, getting to know your vocal tics is part of it and the one-way part of it. Uh, then you also have to be wary a lot of insider lingo. Like, our audience isn't primarily librarians, so if we mm. off-the-cuff say things like ILL, people don't necessarily know what that is. We have to say, and you can also get this on interlibrary loan and maybe even describe what that is. So you don't, we don't want to make the, this isn't a podcast for li, uh, by librarians for librarians. It's a podcast by librarians for the general public. And so that's really one thing to keep in mind. And sometimes it's something you have to fix in the edit. But then we've been talking about engaging with listeners. So I want to talk about something that is used a lot of, uh, as a negative term online, which is the parasocial re uh, relationship. People will feel like they know you. Um, we will, we, we've had some fans and critics. Some people really don't like, like the ums. <laughs> and meeting fans is a lot of fun. And as a library outreach event, we definitely want to be engaging fans, especially locally, but it can be kind of awkward. I've met a few fans and they've been like, I love the podcast. And then like for a second, it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a musician, but the thing about the local punk scene is we all know each other. So like when you meet a fan and that it's okay. And then a month later you're jamming on misfit songs in their basement. But like for the podcast, it can be just kind of disarming at first and you have to, you know, you have to learn how to just kind of smile and nod when you get a compliment or a criticism from someone who's otherwise a stranger. And yeah, and unlike a lot of uh, parasocial relationships, like you will, you will never meet, uh, you will never meet your favorite uh, nas internationally known podcaster or Twitch streamer. But if you live in Omaha, you will hopefully come to one of our branches and get to know us. So this isn't the same amount of uh, negative parasocial relationship that can be with other things. So it's just something to keep in mind and engaging with it is a great way to build an audience and engage with people and engage with our patrons in a more personal way than we might otherwise. Yeah. Except that local celebrity-ness that you have now. <laughs> local micro-celebrity, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now I am going to kick things off to Anna. Yeah, hi. All right, so I'm going to talk about the future of the Book Drop podcast. So. Uh, we think about this, I think, fairly regularly, uh, kind of where we where we want to go as we continue moving forward with this project. Uh, there are a few big kind of buckets of things that we've talked about as far as our, our future goals are concerned. I think the first one and maybe our top 
priority perhaps is to begin transcription. This is something we've talked about for a while and would really love to start doing. Um, the first obvious benefit of transcription is accessibility. Um, if we can provide a non-audio alternative for our content, not only helps folks that are deaf or hard of hearing, but also people for whom English is not their first language. Of course, we're a public library, we're all about access, so anytime we can make something more broadly available, that's gonna be a win for us. There are also a lot of marketing benefits to transcription, uh, slash the SEO on the screen stands for search engine optimization. I'm guessing that's, I think that's fairly common, a common thing that people know about now. Um, it's matching your keywords to Google's algorithm so you can max out your, your search results to the best of your ability. So if we have our uh, podcast content, content transcribed, this gives uh, Google a whole lot more words to, uh, to search through. So that means more opportunities for our content to end up in various search engine result lists. Um, this also has benefits for other marketing purposes. If we have chunks of our podcast already nicely typed out and available, it's really easy to pull like a, an interesting quote for an article or some other marketing tool or to pull out like an interview if you want to make that available someplace else. So it just makes that content um, really accessible and easy to use for other purposes, which is great, it kind of maximizes our, our content there. And another benefit of transcription is that we don't have to do it ourselves. Uh, if we had to, I don't think we would ever do it probably. We're all, I think, pretty much maxed out or near maxed out at our capacity for work. So um, yeah, finding the time to do transcription would be really challenging. It's a time consuming and tedious task. So. Luckily, there are a lot of options out there. We haven't chosen a particular company yet, but we do know of a few options that are low cost and that also provide like tiered levels of service. So we would need something really basic for our podcast transcription. So we could probably get in at like the lowest level of whatever tier um, that a company would offer and be just fine with that going forward. Another thing we have talked about is increasing our listener engagement. Uh, I just mentioned transcription that would help with, uh, theoretically, that would help with our increasing our listener engagement just by making our content in front of, available in front of more eyes, right? So um, that will boost our reach. We also are looking at doing some special events. We uh, have an event coming up in September, a live podcast event for our 100th episode, which is kind of, uh, wild to, to process, but um, I think that will be really fun. I'm a little anxious about it, but also excited. We'll, uh, so we'll do our podcast kind of like normal, but we won't have the comforts of uh, knowing that Aaron will work her editing magic for us when we're done. So um, I think that'll be really fun. And it'll be a chance to have, you know, just like a conversation in a way with our listeners, like David was talking about how it's, you know, our communication is really one way. Um, so it'll be really nice to have more of kind of an immediate feedback and be able to have like kind of a real time dialogue with with our listeners if folks want to participate in that way. So I'm, I think that'll be really fun. And we're all like, I think we're open to other ideas like that. So depending upon how that goes, maybe we'll do more of those. Maybe it will be a disaster. and We'll never do it again. But we're up for experimentation on the book drop, which is uh, wonderful. It's, uh, you know, you don't know how something will go until you try it sometimes. So um, we talked we talked about social media a little bit in this presentation. Uh, we have our query of the week and we also kind of tie that to our reading challenge at times. So we try to um, solicit responses from not just other library staff, but also the public. And sometimes we just aren't able to make that happen and the, the timing that we need to make that possible. So we'd like to maybe tighten that process up a little bit so it's more streamlined so we can regularly get that listener input. It's really fun, I think, for listeners to hear like their names announced on the air with like their answer to whatever the query is. It makes it feel more more personal. And also, you know, sometimes we have reactions to those answers, or um, if it's a coworker, we might have follow up questions for them, or it might spark some other conversation uh, depending upon their answer. It's just it's a way to get to know our listeners and to know each other, which is um, a really lovely thing to be able to do. Um, also related to social media. So of course we always want to stay 
you know, we're part of Omaha Public Library. We're an Omaha Public Library uh, program slash service. Um, it's why we exist. We're here to boost uh, OPL's resources and uh, materials. So we want to always maintain that connection, but we also want to make it easy for folks to like kind of beeline to the book drop if they want to. Uh, we have our own email address. Uh, that's not something that is like really widely publicly used, but uh, we've talked about how it would be nice to have a way for someone to uh, kind of find us easily within the bigger picture of OPL. Like I know on Facebook, we have an OPL page, of course, there's an option to add like groups underneath your, your big umbrella organization. So we've talked about um, like, could we have like a book drop page where it's still obviously connected to the public library, but it's also like something you can get to directly without having to do a lot of sifting around on your own. So like we want to like always maintain that balance of having our own identity, but also maintaining tie to the bigger or parent organization, I guess, uh, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, the other thing we've been talking about, and this is kind of a recent, um, recent thing to consider, I guess, so is a diversity audit. Um, I think all of our listeners are library people today, so maybe a diversity audit is something you've already heard of. A lot of uh, libraries are doing this these days, and we began one at OPL in 2021, February. We started with an in-house diversity audit, and that's since evolved into an audit that's being conducted by two external companies, one for our ebook collection and one for our physical materials. And we're still doing some in-house work for our niche collections. And it's an ongoing process, but it's been, I'm, I'm so excited we're, we're doing it. I think it'll be really great for us uh, going forward. Some of the key goals of our audit is, you know, that it's to assess and measure the representation in your collection, like whose stories, are you telling whose voices are at the table? Who is not there? Um, what are we representing through our through our materials? We also want to use it to improve both staff and patron discovery because we're doing some subject heading work um, in line with that as well. And then we just want to make sure our collection is intentionally inclusive, and we want our podcast to be intentionally inclusive as well. So we want to we talked a little bit about translating the diversity audit process to the podcast. It would look pretty similar, but we would add, but one thing we don't capture with the um, the collection audit is the genre of the item. And we would wanna do that for the podcast. So, you know, we wanna maintain as broad of an appeal as we can for our listeners. Like we all have our favorite kind of areas that we read in, but um, we're also, I think, all pretty open readers where maybe we won't read something in every genre, but we'll read, we'll consider it. I think, like, well, I think we're, we're pretty flexible in uh, what we, will what books will pick up so um we want the podcast to be for everybody so uh we want to kind of start capturing uh the types of books we're talking about too and also whose voices we're we're presenting um and so yeah the value of diversity audit is that it gives us this information in an objective and measurable way like you know we can like i feel like we talk about diverse things on the podcast but feeling like something is real versus having the data to back it up is a different thing. So we want to um, obtain that data. And then another benefit of that too, is that as we go forward, we can look back and see how we've evolved over, over time too, which is a nice thing to be able to do. Um, yeah, so I think um, in keeping with our podcast format, we have a final query for our attendees today. Uh, we would love to hear what would you like to hear about on the book drop or any other book centric podcast? Yeah. Um, all right. So if anybody has and you want to answer the question, you can type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, and we'll see what people um, what may be interested in. Um, as you said, this audience, of course, we're uh, librarians. <laughs> so it'd be different than your general. Although I'm sure librarians listen to your podcast too. Why, did, why not? Um, so yeah, let us know. Type in the question section in your go to webinar interface. What would you like to hear about on the book drop? Um, while we're waiting to see what people type in, we do have some other questions that did come out, um, come in while you were um, talking earlier. So we'll get into some of that too. And also, if you do have any other questions, uh, and any questions you want to ask of the group here, uh, go ahead and type into your GoToWebinar interface as well in the questions or the chat section. Um, I'll also mention too, um, these slides will be available afterwards along with the archive recording. 
um, Aaron will send them to me and we'll have that available to you as well. So um, you'll have all of this uh, good info. Yeah, if anyone is curious where to find us, uh, this is where uh, kind of any place you can find a, a podcast. I think we have tried to be everywhere that uh, most people go to look for them, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Apple. We have a presence on the website. Our website's omahalibrary.org. And we also have an email address if you want to hit us up directly. You are more than welcome to. Uh, we are at the book drop at omahalibrary.org. And we really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us today. Um, I think we all feel really lucky to get to work on this project. I know it's a highlight of my uh, my time <laughs> at work for sure. I'm really grateful for it. And uh, yeah, we if you listen, we'd love to hear what you what you think. Yeah, all right. Um, all right, so someone did have a question earlier when you're talking about what you use. You can go ahead and keep that slide up if you want to while we're um, chatting or the one with the question on it if you want to get um, people to answer the question. Um, so when you're talking about that you start out using Zoom and then a switch to something else, why well, know about the cost of that? Is Zoom cheaper? Obviously, I think Zoom, generally speaking, can, can be free depending on what you need to use it for, how long. Um, what is the cost of what um, you're using now? I can tell you. Give me a second. Um, okay. <laughs> it is, so all of those, like, Riverside, Buzzsprout, any software I think that we've purchased is, uh, they're all tiered. So we pay, oh yeah, that's a year. Let me do some quick math. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, right, Zoom, you could do, if you keep your meetings, what is it, 40 minutes, that could be free. Yeah, we can't we can't do that anymore. Uh, we fail at that. Um, oh, so we pay fifteen dollars a month for Riverside, and it it that covers more than the hours we need. That gives us a little room to breathe on there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's our price if we paid it for the year. And Buzzsprout is something very similar for hosting. I feel like they're all around like it's in a fifteen to twenty dollar range per month. Um, and there's a lot, so much, you get a lot out of like your hosting site, uh, like those analytics, it gives us our RSS feed. Um, it gives us, we can embed players, which we use on our website. And uh, I think it helps, you know, we, we registered with maybe like five different podcast apps and then a lot of those are connected. So what I showed on that other slide is just a fraction. We're really on like I don't know, 20 to 30-ish apps, most of them I've never heard of before. Um, so when you do a couple things, a lot of other things happen on those kind of sites. Yeah, that's happened here with my Encompass Live show. This isn't a podcast, it's a web show, but um, we have people that say they've seen us on all sorts of different library websites or sharing of, of webinars that you can attend or free CE, like anything, anyone kind of grabs it. And depending on our topics as well, uh, sometimes certain topics end up getting shared into certain listservs that are about that, like about historical archives or about corrections or, or something. And, and you just never know who's going to find it. It's all out there publicly on the internet. So who knows? Yeah. Um, what about the cost of transcription, someone wants to ask. I know you said, Anna, you're just starting to get into that. Um, do you have any idea on what that could possibly be? Um, I, Aaron, do you have that handy? I don't even remember what companies we had <laughs> kind of settled on. I know there's multiple ones, yeah. It, again, is not very much. I think because what our, our needs are so low compared to other places or like podcasts or even services that are using things like that, I feel like the service we were circling again it felt like it's otter and it was I like i definitely in i feel like in the 10 to 20 of I, for more than we would need i want to say like 10 to 15 dollars a month is what i was yes remembering uh, 20 dollars a month for otter and i mm. felt like that's the business um there's like an eight dollars a month which maybe that's actually no six thousand minutes per month which is way more than we use on a say, podcast based on how so, much time that, how long you're you know it, how much they yeah, have based yeah. on the recording so like the transcription pros, uh project though would we would 
you know, we have 95 episodes that haven't been transcribed. So we would try to start transcribing going forward and then work backwards as well. Yeah, so we had everything. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. still, yeah, maybe, you know, 10 bucks a month, that stuff adds up for sure, but um, definitely meet our needs. Hmm. Someone has a suggestion too. I'm not sure. I know you said you've been researching this since I'm mentioning here. They said uh, Dragon Professional is a program you can purchase that works for transcriptions. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so okay, make sure I check off all the things it asked here. So one thing that so I would like to hear about on the podcast, or also something if you wanted to um, talk about it now. Um, what 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 about when you're in a book club or a book group, and I think Michelle, you were talking about reading things that you, you know don't really like that aren't in your wheelhouse, and so you're like, Wait, I want to find things I like. How do you deal with a book that you started reading and you really hate it? But I'm supposed to talk about it with our book group. I know for you all, you're supposed to give a book talk, so you, I suppose, have to finish it. But do you? I know in book clubs, sometimes they say, if you don't like it, well, just in read, for reading in general, if you don't like it, it's okay to put it, say, stop, I'm done. I just can't even finish this book. And you come to your book club and say, that's what happened to me. <laughs> I have no idea how it ends because I just couldn't get through it. Is yeah, that, I think that would be a topic. We're very, like we're very pro putting a book down if you don't like it. <laughs> um, I think as a as a general rule. Um, so yeah, if like for me, if I plan to talk about a book on the on an episode and I get into it, I'm like, uh, then I'll I'll try to find a different book if I can. If I truly do not have time, um, I feel like I'll still give a book talk for it, but maybe not a super enthusiastic one. <laughs> we try to not speak poorly of books I got you know we believe too like every book has its reader right so um you don't ever want to be like really harsh um about something or too harsh I guess um yeah I would say that we were very intentional with um the joy of reading so we are trying to talk about like the books that we had good interactions with um I actually just started a book and I was like two hours in and I was like I don't think I want to keep going with this one so I'm not going to. Um, and so as far as like book groups though, I would hope that the, uh, that the, your group norms are that you can have talk negatively about a book because that is your personal experience. And to me, book reading or book groups are the place for you to feel, share your feelings and, um, and kind of either hear somebody else's perspective on why they really connected with it or why they didn't. Um, and so I guess, yeah, I say, th as I said on that one episode of the podcast, there are too many effing books in the world. <laughs> so don't waste your time with one that you don't want to read. Right. Or that's Absolutely. not. Go on to yeah. something that you do, you might enjoy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we have it. We have disagreed on books at book club. I think I'm the only one who's been unrelentingly positive at, in our book club <laughs> episodes. Uh, but yeah, we kind of share it as a personal opinion and we talk about what didn't work. And like, so you, as long as you have the voice of positivity on the book club episodes, you're fine. And then like for book talks, we just like, if we don't like a book, we don't talk about it on that episode. So. <laughs> um. Oh, here's a suggestion or, or a question, and then also possibly a suggestion about something you'd like to hear on the on the book drop. Um, how many authors have you had on your show? Um, have you actually brought in authors of the books? And if you have you had, or have you had any authors approach you to be on the podcast, like local Nebraska ones, I would assume. But I suppose you can call anybody. Sorry, I have a tornado uh, test going on in the background. If you guys can hear that. It's 11 o'clock in yeah, Nebraska, so everybody. <laughs> We've got a yeah. handful. Um, so we would love to bring on more guests. I think the logistics of that, I feel like, always went out. But we, um, Ted Wheeler, we had Timothy Schaffer, who's this year's Omaha Reads author last year. Um, oops, there it is. Uh, Matt Mason, the state poet, um, Cassandra Montag, who was our Omaha Reads author a couple years back. So we try to get them when we can. I would love to have more. Um, yeah, and if you're an author and you would like to talk to us, reach out to us.
I think it's over. <laughs> it's it winding down. <laughs> Am I the only place where that's happening? I'm so sorry. No, it's happening here too, but yeah. I've been, yeah, it's been happening here. I think we it's right next to the library. Yes, ours, <laughs> our, ours here in Lincoln are scheduled our tornado warnings for those of you who are interested, always a little after 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, which yeah. is when this show is. So I am always muted usually at the first time. <laughs> After I do my intro, I'm like mute because those things, they're going to go off. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all right. So I've got another question here. I just want to see if anyone has any other. Um, we are a little after 11, but that's okay. We did start a little after 10. And we will go as long as everyone has questions. We don't get cut off here for anything. Um, so if you do have any questions, get it typed into the question section. Um, but we do have one here, um, and I think you sort of addressed this earlier, but I think expand a little bit on it. Um, how do you keep the podcast fresh and prevent monotony? That's a very good question. Uh, I mean, I think you have to admit that there's ups and downs. There's days that we like get off of a show of recording. We're like, man, that was really good. It was so much fun. But there's there's days where I think there's stuff going on outside of the podcast and I'm sure that we feel that all a little bit. I mean, you got to put your game face on <laughs> when you're making an episode. Um, I think some of those future plans, uh, like social media, think I, we're thinking also a lot about how else can we include more of our other staff members? How can we bring on more guests from within OPL? I think that would keep it fresh. Part of the, um, one of our thoughts about the um, diversity audit is what genres are we not mentioning very often or a lot? And maybe it's because we don't read those, but who in our organization reads in that area that we could bring on? So maybe a few episodes in the future are less, maybe it's one of us and like four other staff members who all read like really steamy romances or Westerns. I'm trying to think what genres we don't talk about a ton. <laughs> so hopefully there's stuff like that. I think it's always constantly trying to brainstorm, but there's yeah, definitely ups I, and downs. Yeah, I would say in our planning meetings, I mean, again, we're all in professionals in as librarians. So we're also like reading Book Riot articles and other library journal articles and all that kind of stuff. And so kind of looking through that also through our podcast lens of like different type of topics that we would want to talk about or a new like just doing an episode on based on covers or you know being a little more creative so that um, the theme is really expansive that way again we have more to select from to be able to talk about yeah. i think do, one of our Sorry, uh, we, we maintain a pretty we have like a long running list of like just kind of brainstorming ideas. Uh, so I, any of us can just go and add to that running list anytime we have anything brilliant to add to you in the, the idea list. And I think um, like keeping it tied to things like, like we, now that we've done this for a few seasons, we have like a really good rhythm, I feel like, and also a good understanding of like what our capacity is. Like we can't do an episode every week where we're talking about books because we don't have time to uh, find all of those books and re you know read them and talk about them in a thoughtful and intelligent way. So like balancing um, like a news episode or um, like an episode where we know we might have a guest or an episode that is uh, like, we do like library secrets episodes sometimes like kind of behind the scenes stuff. Um, but, and I think tying, like, so we always, but we do regularly have things tied to the reading challenge and the reading challenge changes every year. So that's an easy way to mm. have something new to talk about kind of regularly. Our book club episodes are something we have scheduled kind of, I think we're doing them three times a year now, um, just like spaced out just in a way that um, works for our personal workflows, but also that makes sense for the organization. Like we also, we really, I think we're also not afraid to kind of, uh, like, well, we want to be like broad in our reading interests. Like, I we're also okay, like, kind of leaning into what we are kind of pet uh, reading areas are too. Like, every October, we were like, it's spooky book time, so we'll like find different ways to talk about like a, a spooky scenario or like a I don't know a haunted book or something. But mm -hmm. 
when I yeah when I first joined this team I you know the well read collective the, not the book drop uh, itself because um, I was already part of the well read collective at that point but like I was kind of wondering if I should embrace my uh, embrace my role as a niche reader or try to read more what everyone was reading and I decided to lean into being a niche reader but then figure out why my niche appealed to me and then understand more appeals in general. And that was a lot of fun. Um, and then sometimes one thing I wanted to say is sometimes just our kind of weird episode ideas are some of our best ones. Like we did one that was based off of books with pink covers and that's, yeah, that's one of my favorite episodes we've <laughs> ever done. So. So random. Yes. I remember the book and this cover was pink <laughs> yeah. or the title of this cover is pink. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's it. Someone just has had a suggestion for you said, what would you like to hear about? Um, possibly doing a shows on um, books that have become movies or TV shows. Mm -hmm. And is which and for some people, this has been, we did a show a while ago on this, um, which is better, the book or the movie? And sometimes there's dissent among, assent among, dissent among that. <laughs> Not everyone agrees. <laughs> yeah, love it. Absolutely. I have some divisive opinions in that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so people like, uh, they, yeah, people are very, very, um, take it very personally when their favorite book becomes something on TV or a movie. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question I think we'll do since we're getting a little late here. Um, you mentioned the uh, three seasons. When do your seasons actually run from? What is your um, broadcast uh, dates? Yes, so question. we do it as calendar year. So our first season was just April to December and we kind of take off the second half of December to take a break with holidays and November is usually a light month too because of the holiday. And then we start back up in January. So we have done about two and a half years, but that first season, because we were doing four episodes a month or every single week, the episode number in that season, I think, is equivalent to what we're doing in these second and third season. Sure. All right. I would also say I forgot to say in our lessons learned, we were also <laughs> book talking about most th like full book talks, three or four titles each, each episode, mm -hmm. which was also exhausting. So That's that a was a big lesson learned of, hey, we don't need to. <laughs> yeah, <we laughs> Again, there are a lot of books in the world. And so we have time to talk about them. So that's when we kind of cut that down to two titles each for an episode. And you can get more into them too. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Do you have a limit for how long you want your episodes to be? Or? <laughs> we started out <laughs> like 30 minutes and we, with when we have five people on, um, I think we've even had six when we have guests. So when you have that many people, just even a normal discussion, it you're going to be closer to an hour so i think the sweet spot is like 45 to 50 minutes but we have a lot of episodes close to an hour and i think some of our longer ones are probably like 70 something minutes if you got really so, into something <laughs> yeah so we i was very cautious about this i was worried at the beginning when we would get close to an hour that I was going to get in trouble but i think if, if the content's worth it then the content's worth it and i don't yeah. No one's telling us no anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, people can listen as long as they have time for it and then come back and pick up where they left off. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And do it in that all at once. Yeah. 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 We have done a couple of mini episodes too. I think it's been a minute. And those are like like maybe 10, 15 mm -hmm. minutes. And those are nice, like where it's just maybe one of us. Um, and they, they can be done in kind of like in response to like maybe an issue that's come up or something that um we want to address, but maybe not appropriate for like a full length episode. David, do you want to talk more about that at all? Oh, yeah. yeah, the mini episodes are great if you have a guest who um, can't commit to an hour. Um, sure. And also, since they're not part of like the normal weekly routine, we can just kind of do them whenever. We can kind of work around the schedule to do them too, since they're not part of the regular schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. 
All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody typed in any last minute desperate questions they wanted to ask of um, you all. So I think we will um, wrap it up for today. And I'll do my little wrap up here. So um, I'm going to get my screen up here. There we go. All right. So thank you all for being here. Um, this is great. I was so glad to hear about your um, um, what you have you all made this happen and as you said at the beginning <clears throat> Aaron this is something born of the pandemic and um that lots of libraries did something um on the fly okay we're all at home now what do we do and um I'm, I'm hoping I think lots of these things will continue long after uh because they work they're great people like them podcasts have been around for a long time other virtual things and events libraries have done um they made it so much more accessible to people who could not come into the library pre-pandemic um before for things um people who are uh um, handicapped can't make it have anxiety issues um people who have kids but i can't take the time to take them to the library and do their 20 minute story time and then take them home that's a lot but i can sit them in front of the story time that's being broadcast live on facebook live and that works great uh it's really helped out, I think, everything. So I'm hoping, just like yours, is obviously you look like you're still going to go strong and keep going. <laughs> um, these kind of things will um, continue. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, we will uh, wrap up here now. Get my screen going here. Um, so as I said, this um, show has been recorded, and it will be available on our Encompass Live website. Uh, if you uh, use uh, whatever is your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, the name of our show, um, it's the only thing that will come up. Nobody's allowed to use our name. <laughs> and you'll get our main page here where we have our upcoming shows, but then our archive shows are listed right underneath. Uh, most recent one at the top of the page here. So today's show will be there. We'll have the recording. We'll have a link to the slides as well. Uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me, um, it should be up and ready. Uh, everyone who attended today's show, <coughs> excuse me, and registered for today's show uh, will get an email from me directly letting you know that it's um, up and ready. Uh, we also pushed out into our social media. We were talking, you, you all were talking about that. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you like to use Facebook, you can give us a like over there. We do promotion. Um, here's a reminder about logging in today's show. We'll meet the presenters that are um, PR people here do. And uh, when our recordings are available, we post them here as well. We also post out to Twitter and I think Instagram using the hashtag EncompLive. Uh, so you can also look for that there. Uh, while we're here on the archive page, I'll also mention there's a search feature here. You can look up and see if we've done a topic on a particular show, a sh show on a particular topic. Um, you can search the whole archives or there's most, most, just the most recent 12 months if you want to. That is because this is our full show archives and I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because it's huge. Uh, going back to when Encompass Life premiered, which was in January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of recordings here. Uh, and uh, we'll keep them up there available as long as there's some place to host them. Right now, everything is on YouTube. Um, we're librarians. We This is one of the things we do, keep things for historical purposes. So we we'll always have them up there. But just do pay attention to the original broadcast date. Um, some of the shows will be great and fine and stand the test of time and be good resources, but things will become old and outdated. Uh, information and resources may have changed drastically. Uh, some things might not exist anymore. <laughs> some products or services, some things going on. Uh, people may, may no longer work at the places where they were when they were later on our show. So uh, just pay attention to that when you are watching any of our shows. Um, and you can see here, uh, Encompass Live does officially broadcast from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, as you can see from our archives, we tend to not stick to that. <laughs> More often than not, we go a little over, but that's fine. But not too much. Uh, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, hope you join us next week when we'll be talking about reinventing programming kits. Uh, Erica Rogers, who's from our Hastings Public Library here in Nebraska, has done take-home kits uh, so something else in response to the pandemic and she will talk about uh, what she has done with that so please sign up for that show and any of our future episodes uh, thanks again everyone thank you Aaron Michelle David and Anna it was great to see you all and um, we thank will um, everyone listen to the book drop it's a great podcast <laughs> all right bye-bye everybody thank you Krista